Welcome back. I hope all is well. This is actually the first video of 2022. And if you've seen any of my other videos before, you might notice that this setup is a little bit more minimal. Uh, I don't have my desk right in front of me and all this stuff on top of it. Well, if I don't have my desk, then clearly there's no stuff on top of it, but that's besides the point. Today, we're gonna talk about the No Surprises Act. I know it's been in the works for quite a while. However, last week was the first week I heard anything about it. I saw it written about on blogs and email chains, a lot of different therapists and providers kind of freaking out about this No Surprises Act and what we're supposed to do. So it kind of caught me off guard. So what I wanna talk about is how I deal with things like that in private practice. I'm gonna give you some really, really helpful resources about the No Surprises Act, but I'm also gonna give you a really helpful, I'm actually gonna give you a set of principles and a workflow that you can utilize to manage these kinds of surprises. Not the No Surprises Act, but when things like the No Surprises Act pop up, how do we manage that well? You know, what do we, what's the system we have in place to deal with that? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. I do think it's gonna be really, really helpful for you. But before we do, if you haven't done so already, please do go ahead and subscribe down below. But only if you want to, there is no pressure. Let's start by talking about the No Surprises Act first. Now, again, I am not a lawyer, so I'm not inclined to give any legal counsel. I would never do that. With that being said, I'll tell you a bit about what I know in regards to the No Surprises Act. So I guess the spirit of the law is to prevent surprise medical bills. So for example, if you go to the hospital and you get a procedure done and you expect to be billed for just that procedure, and then you return home and three, four, five, six months later, you, you get a bill in the mail and it's for all these different charges and you have a huge amount to owe, it's trying to prevent that. And I think that's a great thing. Surprise medical bills is something that we can avoid, I guess, and that's what we're working to do. And I'm all on board for that. Uh, at the same time, uh, it does impact us as social workers and therapists in private practice. Now, when I first started reading the blog posts and the different articles, people were saying that, oh, you actually, as a therapist in private practice, you don't need to do anything, just be aware. However, as I did a little more research, I realized that that was not the case at all. In fact, there's a component of the No Surprises Act called the Good Faith Estimate or a Good Faith Estimate. I'm not exactly sure exactly, but what that is is a form that you as a therapist need to provide to a client that gives them an estimate about the costs of the services you'll be providing. Now, I don't know the exact details about what needs to go in there. But what I am gonna do is link down below a link from CMS, the Center for Medicaid Services. This is probably gonna be the, like, this is like the source, right? So if you look at this PDF, you're gonna have a whole bunch of files in there directly from CMS. You can read all about what the law is about and you can actually look at the template that they have for you. That is probably what I would read and stick to if I were you. Now, later on in the video, we're gonna talk a little bit about how does a social worker, a therapist in private practice navigate something like this? It's more like a legal issue, right? A new law comes into play. And then as a therapist, you need to make changes to your practice as a result of that law. But I'm not an attorney, so what do I do? We're gonna talk about that workflow in just a bit. All right, so the first thing is this. We need to be in a position to even become aware of these changes that are taking place. So we need to be informed about the laws that are coming into effect, the policies that are changing, all those kinds of things. If you worked in a hospital or an agency setting, there was someone in that setting whose job it was to be informed about these things and then to implement it uh, with the staff, right? So you just came into work and then someone would say, hey, this is taking effect, this is what we need to do. And you would go ahead and follow the procedures or whatever the case may be. In private practice, that's now your job, right? And that's actually quite a hard job to be informed about all the different changes that are taking place so that you can run your practice well effectively, up to date, up to code, up to standard. And that is super, super important. So how do we position ourselves to be informed? Well, a couple ways. One thing I like to do is to check the websites for the association for my particular profession. So I'm a social worker and there is the NASW, the National Association of Social Workers. There's the CASW, the clinical, sorry, there's the CS. There's the CSWA, the Clinical Social Work Association. And these are associations that do a really, really good job of staying up to date with laws and policies and all sorts of things that people need to be aware of within that particular profession. 
Now, these are not the most exciting and vibrant websites, but they have really, really helpful information. They're usually posting memos or other things that keep social workers and other professionals informed. So if you're a counselor, if you're a psychologist, check with your associations. They usually have really, really good up-to-date information. So that's a really, really good place to start. Another thing you can do is to stay up-to-date or subscribe to attorney blogs. So there are a few healthcare attorneys that I have become familiar with either through reading their blogs or working with professionally. And they put out newsletters and different blog posts. And what I'll usually do is subscribe to them because they, first off, are attorneys. They know exactly exactly what the laws mean and what they're talking about. And they usually have that content on their blogs. So there's one or I think there's two people that I typically follow that keep me up to date through their newsletter or their blog post. I'll put links to everything down below in the description so you can check it out for yourself. But this is another way to stay up to date on different changes that are taking effect. Another thing you can do is to check with a peer or a friend or a colleague who works in a bigger institution. So if you have a peer who you know works in a big hospital system in your city, perhaps ask them, hey, are there any changes coming down the pike? Have you heard anything? What kind of policies are you guys, uh, you know, what kind of policies are you guys following? You can usually rely on a big institution to be implementing these kinds of changes regularly when they need to take effect. So by networking and reaching out to people who work in those big institutions, that's another great way to be informed about things coming down the pike. So another thing you can do is to stay updated on your EMR's blog, website, newsletter, whatever they have, because an EMR or electronic medical record is usually going to be impacted by the different changes, right? So for example, the No Surprises Act, the Good Faith Estimate, this whole thing, this is gonna require documentation. And where does your documentation live? In your EMR, your electronic medical record. So those people, those people producing that software are obviously gonna be invested in knowing more about that because it impacts their software directly. And so what you can do is subscribe to their newsletter, blog, whatever it may be, and learn more about the changes that are coming down the pike. That's exactly what I did when it came to this No Surprises Act. I follow Simple Practice. I take a look at their website. I think it's called Pollen. It's some sort of magazine or whatever. Um, regardless though, they posted about the No Surprises Act and that's why I found out about it. And then from there, I did more research. All right, so now let's talk about the workflow for managing a situation like this. All right, so the first step is gonna be this. We need to be informed about the law and the changes that are taking place. And we just talked about that with the different ways we become informed. Second, we need to decide whether or not this is important for our practice. So for example, I saw the No Surprises Act I saw that it was being written about and talked about, and then I saw that it had direct implications for therapists. How did I know that? Because therapists were talking about it. I read the CMS guidelines. It mentioned healthcare and therapy and all sorts of things. And so I realized that this is actually something that I need to be aware of, right? So that's step number two. Is it something you really need to be aware of and invest in? Because if it is, it's gonna take time to do the research. If it's not, you don't wanna spend a lot of time researching things that are not important for you. Once we determine that something is important for us or something is required of us due to a change taking place, we then need to get invested. This is the hard part, right? I think that when it comes to practice management or especially this kind of like policy administration kind of things, laws taking place, this can get quite tedious and boring. And quite honestly, most of us didn't go to school to read laws and legislation and, and things like that. Regardless though, it's a really important part of our practice. So we somehow need to get motivated to do the work required uh, to implement the practice policy well, or to implement the changes well. How did I do that? Well, I recognized that if I didn't implement these practices, I was gonna be out of code, not following the laws. And because of that, I recognize there's a connection between this research I need to do and the well-being of my private practice and ultimately of the clients that I serve. And that gave me the motivation I needed to follow through with all the work required to do the research and to implement different changes into my practice. The third step is going to be to do research. Now, this is probably the most tedious part. There are so many different resources on the internet. You do wanna limit it to credible resources, right? So you want to be reading the blogs of attorneys. You wanna read the publications that come from professional associations. You wanna read the documentation that comes directly from the legislature itself. You can look at your state's website about laws. You can look at the CMS, the Center for Medicaid Services. You really wanna do your research in a way where you're looking at like the root 
source of the information. So usually I'll start with reading the actual legislature itself and I may not understand all of it, but I usually start there. And then I begin to read the most credible sources, right? So I, the CMS, the packet that they give on their website, I'm gonna read that because that is like the root of the law. So you really wanna do your research and you wanna do it well. You don't wanna just be reading random blogs or random websites. You wanna read all the information that comes from the most credible resources. And so following the research, it's gonna be really helpful to confirm with an attorney. Now, I do recognize as a therapist, I am not a legal expert. I am not an attorney. I am not trained in that way. I'm limited, right? I can read the laws and that's great. I can understand them most of the time and that is really great. But my understanding is limited because I'm, I'm not a lawyer. That's not what I was trained to do. And as I recognize that, I do want to make sure that I consult with a professional about anything that's legal, anything that is related to the law or those kinds of changes to make sure that I understand correctly, right? So what I'll do is do all of my research, make sure I understand it as best as I can, and then I'll consult with an attorney. I'll talk about the research I've done, what I think I know, what I think I need to do. And then that attorney either confirms that what I've done is correct and that's great, or they say, ah, you know, you, you don't really understand. Maybe you should do this or do that. And they give me more correct guidance because that's their specialty, they're lawyers. Now, that is an important step. As therapists or people in private practice who are not lawyers, we have to recognize that's that's a limitation. And you don't wanna move forward implementing different changes and practices without consulting a legal professional. That could be risky, and that's a risk you can eliminate by talking to a lawyer. And then after all those steps, I just go for it. I recognize that there's always gonna be a little bit of a risk. There's always gonna be some chance that I make a mistake, but we can never be 100% certain in private practice. We can get as certain as we can, which is, if you follow those steps I just talked about, you will be in a really good place to feel as certain as you possibly can about moving forward in a way that is correct or that is in line with the laws. And so you really wanna to do your due diligence, but then you just go for it, recognizing the limitation to certainty. And so finally, you need to be flexible and ready to readjust when necessary. So most of the time after implementing new policies and practices, you recognize there's things you missed, things you overlooked. And so we have to be flexible and say, ah, you know what, I missed it. Let me correct it, let me change it, let me fix it, and then move forward. So you gotta be flexible as well. So that is pretty much it. That is a bit about the No Surprises Act, as well as a workflow that will help you be as certain as you possibly can about making different legal changes to your practice. Hopefully this was helpful for you. Hopefully you learned something. And until then, I look forward to seeing you soon.